uh, namely the Earth's outer core and atmospheres of giant planets, uh, the inside of the atmospheres of, of planets, uh, of Jupiter and Saturn. <coughs> Uh, what happens there is that uh, the interior of the planets is very hot, so uh, the atmos atmospheres are heated from, from the inside, and they're also cooled from outside by radiative uh, cooling, uh, because the heat is just radiated into the cosmos. And so there is a, uh, quite certainly there is a convection uh, going, going on there. A deep, so-called deep convection, because the layer, the atmospheres are quite, quite thick. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, so far, the, our understanding of the, of the deep convection uh, mainly comes from the, from the numerical models. Um, there were some early uh, lab experiments and, and some theories uh, which kind of predicted of, of behavior of those flows uh, but uh, now, nowadays, we mostly look at, uh, at uh, 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 kind of general circulation type uh, numerical simulations of the atmospheres and the, the Earth's core as well. Uh, so there's nothing wrong, of course, with numerical simulations except uh, that uh, they're quite, oops, sorry, <coughs> they're quite dissipative, uh, in fact. So if you uh, take the Ekman number, typical Ekman number of the, of the simulations, it's uh, about 10 to the minus 6. So e Ekman number is the ratio of viscosity to uh, Coriolis force, um, uh, 10 to the minus 6. So, uh, and, uh, and, and this is just the kind of the newest, the latest uh, numerical simulations, 10 to the minus 6. Before that, the Ekman number was typically 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 5. Um, so, the dissipation is, is uh, quite, quite important in, in those models. So uh, that the, um, the researchers, they need to overforce their models. So the, the heat, and, uh, heat and flux, is, they must be much, much, several, many orders of magnitude higher than they uh, really are in, in, in the planets. Uh, to be able to get the velocities uh, which are comparable to the real velocities in, in the atmosphere. Uh, by the way, the, uh, the Ekman number in, um, for example, in the Earth's core is on the order of 10 to the minus 15. So there is still nine orders of magnitude to go. So we can talk about the validity of the numerical, the results of numerical simulations only, uh, only hoping that in the asymptotic case they, they give us the, the right picture. Um, so there are uh, two types of uh, general numerical modeling of planetary atmospheres. There are shallow water type versus uh, deep convection uh, kind of dynamics. Shallow water, uh, shallow water models usually are uh, used to uh, generate, generate zonal jets, just like those bands on Jupiter or Saturn um, from, from uh, mainly uh, two-dimensional like turbulence. Uh, but they have difficulty to, uh, to give the equatorial jet, for example, uh, on Jupiter or Saturn. Um, those equatorial jets, they are prograde, so they rotate in the same sense of the, uh, as the planet, and so they rotate faster than the planet. Or uh, you can call them cyclonic as well. <clears throat> uh, deep deep uh, convective uh, models, they don't have any problems with reproducing the equatorial jets. Um, So um, the question uh, we, we ask ourselves is, uh, is, can we offer some kind of uh, a general theory which would just add to understanding of what's going on, there's some, some basic physics, and perhaps in the future uh, contribute to some kind of parameterization of this small scale, small scale convection in the atmosphere so that uh, it can be used in, in those general circulation models because we can't really hope that uh, we, we can uh, resolve all those fine scales in numerical uh, models anytime soon. <coughs> um, so, so this talk is mainly about theory, but uh, before I, uh, I'll talk about theory, uh, I'll talk a little bit about numerical, uh, l l uh, sorry, l l laboratory experiment. And, and we needed to, to do this experiment just to kind of convince ourselves uh, um, 
that uh, this one of the key elements of the theory actually works. When I start talking about lab experiments in, at oceanographic meetings, I sometimes feel like a dinosaur because not, not many people do these rotating tank experiments anymore. But anyway, I, I'll try to convince you that in this case it can be uh, useful and even kind of uh, be superior to a numer numerical model. So we have a rotating tank. Oops, sorry. <coughs> We have a rotating tank um, here. It's 1.1 meter uh, in diameter, and it rotates very fast. The period of rotation is 2.6 seconds, so you can, it's, it's a big thing, and it rotates very, very fast. So uh, the surface of fluid, of course, is uh, parabolic, and um, we insulate, thermally insulate the, the tank, except, except at the top. So the top is just open uh, to, to atmosphere. We can heat water by a heater at the bottom. And also, when we heat water, it starts cooling from the top. It evaporates from the top, so it cools, cools from the top. So mainly, uh, what we did is we heated water uh, before the experiment. And then um, during the experiment, we just observed the effect of cooling from the surface of this warm water. Warm water has an additional advantage that its viscosity is very low. It's about three times lower than the viscosity of water at room temperature. So we can actually reduce Ekman number to very low values. It's about 10 to the minus 6. So in, in this sense, we, we, we're doing better than numerical simulations. <coughs> and also, um, well, if, if, if you would like to do this kind of simulation, uh, it, it might be a bit challenging because it's three-dimensional flow. And the, the scales of the flow uh, are very small. So when, uh, can, uh, when uh, uh, cooling happens, uh, the very small, very small uh, dense uh, parcels at the, at the surface appear and, and sink. And they create a tiny vortices. So if you look at this picture, you can see those, those dots. And they're about 5 millimeter in, in, in radius or diameter. So we, we also have a, a thermal camera here, and you can see the, the temperature, temperature field in, in the tank as well. <clears throat> so we use a, a new method of measurements uh, in our lab experiment. Because in, in lab experiments, it, it's usually a problem to measure a velocity field with, with, reasonable, with reasonable, reasonable resolution. So we use the altimetry, just like um, the altimeter used by oceanographers, the satellite altimetry. So we measure the elevation of the surface. Um, so the elevation eta. So any flow within the tank creates pressure field. Pressure field creates the uh, um, surface elevation. So a certain variation of the elevation, uh, uh, elevation uh, it's called eta. Here, and this is what we measure. We uh, use optical methods, so it's, it's decoded by color, the, uh, those, the gradient of the elevation. <laughs> so uh, the, the parabolic surface of the tank is basically used like a telescope mirror to amplify those tiny, tiny perturbations. The, the perturbations are very small, on the order of 100 microns, so you, can, you can't really see them by, by naked eye. But uh, uh, using this, this method, you can. <clears throat> So what? So we measure basically pressure field, the gradient of pressure, because the the surface elevation con converts into into pressure. So what what can we do uh, about velocity? So this is rotating fluid. So um, if we just start with the equation of shallow water, two two G equation. Uh, in the first approximation, of course, uh, we can obtain the geostrophic the geostrophic velocity. So we ignore the time tendency and the nonlinear term uh, because the Rosman number is, is quite small. And, uh, and we get the uh, geostrophic velocity. So geostrophic velocity is just a combination of the, the, the gradient of the uh, surface elevation. So it's direct measurement of um, geostrophic velocity, if you like. And then uh, we, can, we can do another approximation by plugging in this in, into the original equation. And so we get two additional terms here, 
uh, which comes from the uh, time tendency and, and the nonlinear terms. So we, it's, it's quasi geostrophic approximation. So we measured the pressure gradient, and we can um, obtain velocity in quasi geostrophic approximation in our experiments. So the resolution is quite high. We resolve uh, just half a millimeter resolution. So, and we get uh, lots of lots of data, hundreds of gigabytes typically. So it's in this sense, it also can be compared to numerical simulations. So this is like our analog computer, if you like. <clears throat> uh, we also used, uh, to our surprise, this uh, altimeter method uh, didn't work for, for some, some specific aspect of our uh, experiment. So we needed to use something else to, to get real velocity, not quite just real velocity. Uh, and we use PIV. Uh, so you, you're probably familiar with PIV is particle image velocity. You just put lots of uh, tiny particles in the water and you follow their motion. Um, how passive they are. How passive? Well, they, they are small and the flow is uh, relatively slow. So I, I, I would say they are uh, quite good in this sense. There, there are lots of literature on PIV which uh, kind of confirms confirms that. Uh, and in, in our case, it's, we have reasonable, re, reasonably sure about that. So those polyethylene particles, they, they are floating just, just above the surface of water, actually. <coughs> so this is a typical movie from the experiment. Uh, it, it's not much to see, but you, if, you, if you look closer, you can see those tiny particles at the surface, and you can see variation of color. And you can see what's going on, some, some small vortices. And if you look even closer, you can probably see the, the zonal jets, which develop there, too. Um, and there is another movie. This is from thermal camera. This one doesn't play. But anyway, it's, it's the same thing. So you can see all those variations of, of temperature there, tiny, tiny, tiny tornadoes, tiny vortices. <clears throat> So this is what we see. Um, this is the, the total field, uh, relative vorticity here. Um, you can, it's normalized by, by planetary vorticity. So this is basically Rosby number here. You can see it is below one. And the average Rosby number is uh, about 0 0.1, 0 0.2, perhaps. So if you uh, zoom in into those vortices, so this is what you see, that those typical words of on the order of one centimeter and below uh, size, we, we can resolve the velocity, etc. And this is the azimuthal velocity. You can see kind of like zonal jets. They're not well formed like those jets on, on Jupiter and Saturn, uh, because we are not quite there in the regime for those jets to, to form, but, but they're there. So for comparison, uh, you, you can see the, the uh, polar regions of, of Jupiter. This is a very recent picture, which was obtained by this uh, flybys of, of the spacecraft above Jupiter and Saturn. Uh, what, what, what you can see here is, is, again, those tiny vortices. They're everywhere there. On Jupiter, they're a little bit bigger. On Saturn, they're very tiny. Also on Saturn, they're uh, other, other interesting features like uh, polar, very intense polar vortex and this, um, and this structure too, but I, I'm not going to talk about them here. <coughs> so this is what's happening in the, in the uh, laboratory tank. We have those perturbations of cold elements which sink. And uh, when they sink, so they sink along uh, effective gravity. Effective gravity in the lab is, is regular gravity plus uh, centrifugal force, omega squared r. Here, so uh, it's, not a, uh, it's not aligned with the, with the rotation axis. So rotation axis is vertical. Effective gravity is not. Um, it varies with radius. So the par partials sink not vertically, but at, at an angle. But the Taylor columns they, they generate, uh, they, they generate Taylor columns by emitting inertial waves. They are, of course, uh, vertical, or, or rather aligned with the, with the rotation axis. 
So this is the key feature of, of, the, of the experiment and the theory as well. So the, the, the uh, gravity is not aligned with, with rotation. On, on the planet, it's just regular gravity. Well, effective gravity, centrifugal forces are included there too. And of course, it's not aligned with, with rotation as well, but it, in a different sense. In, in the lab, it's, it goes like this, and, and uh, uh, on the planet, it goes in the, in the opposite sense, but it doesn't matter. <coughs> okay, so when uh, the, the parcels uh, move in the water, uh, it turns out they move with constant speed, with constant velocity, uh, uh, because they emit inertial waves, so they experience drag. Uh, th there, are, um, there were some previous papers, starting from a paper by Sturzon in the 50s, where people studied the motion of objects in the rotating fluid, mo objects moving along the axis of rotation and, and across it, and they um, showed that there is a drag, drag force experienced by those objects, uh, either solid objects or, or fluid, ob uh, liquid object, doesn't matter. Uh, and, uh, Eventually, those objects, they, they move at constant speed. So, w which means that the uh, force, the buoyancy force experienced by the, the, those parcels, by those blobs, uh, uh, um, they are transmitted to the bulk fluid by, by the mechanism of inertial waves. So, this is completely an inviscid mechanism. So, it, it doesn't depend on the Ekman number. And uh, so, and it results in this forcing of the, of the bulk fluid. So, and then we can write down two equations for the general circulation in the, in the tank, uh, which are just uh, regular equations of, of motion with the Coriolis force here, a little bit of dissipation, kind of relief friction here, and, and this, and this uh, uh, extra forcing in the uh, right-hand side. So we neglected nonlinearity here, assuming that the Rosby number is small. And, and this gives the circulation like this. So this is azimutal velocity u. It's proportional to this uh, extra force. And, and also, there's also some radial velocity, but it's quite small because, because this uh, uh, relaxation time is, is quite large. Um, Another effect which those parcels moving in the water generate, is they distribute some temperature field, um, they move it around, so there might be some variations of temperature in the tank, so, and, and then we can uh, calculate thermal wind, geostrophic thermal. So this is geostrophic part of the flow, this is a geostrophic part of the flow here, which is given by the external force. So the total flow is the sum of those two. Um, I think I need to accelerate. <clears throat> so you, you can compare this with the, with the Ekman theory uh, in, in the ocean. So in, uh, when wind blows above the surface of the ocean, it, it, uh, it, it uh, transmits momentum to the water, and then it's, uh, this uh, flow spirals down, so famous Ekman spiral. But the end result is very simple. The transport, the integrated uh, velocity over, the, over depths, is actually uh, to the right of the wind and, and proportional to the wind stress. So the same, the same, exactly the same is here, but the force is coming not from the surface of water, but from within uh, due to those inertial waves. Um, and uh, this is what we measure in, in the experiment. So we can uh, measure the thermal wind using our thermal camera. So thermal wind is, is not very large here. It just goes around zero there. But uh, we also, um, we measured this uh, uh, circulation here. It, it's, this is a velocity the function of radius of the tank, so it's approximately linear. And we can compare it with theory, uh, what, what theory is predict, predicting. Uh, for, for theory, we need to know this, this parameter which is the product of the buoyancy force by F. F is the concentration of, of those uh, buoyant parcels in, in the water. So we don't really know it, but we can uh, estimate it by measuring the um, delta T uh, temperature, RMS temperature variation in the tank. Again, using the 
using, using the thermal camera. And, and we uh, put some uh, coefficient C here, order of unity coefficient here. Uh, and it turns out to be, from all those measurements, turns out to be 0 0.75 in the experiment. So, uh, so now we're reasonably sure that this forcing actually works, and it drives water in the, in the laboratory tank. So this forcing due to misalignment of gravity and, uh, and, uh, and, and rotation. So let, let's now uh, lo look at the spherical planet. So uh, let's say we release particles from the inner surface, or uh, so buoyant particles from the inner surface, or uh, heavier particles from the outer surface here, and uh, let's see how they move. So we have uh, the results of all those theories uh, there, which uh, gives us the uh, nice analytical expressions for drug force experienced by the, those parcels. Uh, so the, there is drug, uh, it's different for parcels moving uh, along the rotation axis and across. Uh, there is coriolis force, and there is also lift force, which acts sideways on, on the parcels. So if we put them all together and uh, invert, invert this ex expression here, we can uh, calculate the velocities of the, particle, of the parcels. So we get this nice uh, expression. So we uh, get the radial velocity. So this is cylindrical coordinate system, by the way. So the radius here, the z-axis like that. And well, theta is is uh, collated here. We will be using it too. Anyway, so we we get this uh, expressions for the velocity of the particles. So we will be using uh, vr and vz mainly, just in the meridional plane of of the plane. We we don't care about how parcels move in the azimuthal direction. So the interesting feature of those velocities of VR and VZ, they, they are different by a factor of two, exactly. Um, so this, this theory, of course, is without magnetic field. But there is also a similar theory by, by Moffat and Loper. Uh, they include magnetic field in, into consideration and, and did similar analysis to what Sturzen did. And uh, they obtained uh, the coefficient for the, uh, for the case of magnetic field, uh, for the uh, toroidal magnetic field, actually. Um, and it's, it looks quite similar to here. And also, the same, the same thing. Um, it's, it's actually a bit mysterious to me, but maybe there is some simple explanation to this. So the velocities are still uh, different by a factor of two. So it works for cases without magnetic field and with magnetic field. So now we can easily write down the uh, equation of motion for particles, dr dt, dz dt equal to velocity, which is given uh, analytically. Uh, velocity depends on the gravity. Gravity varies like uh, uh, g sine theta. Uh, theta is, is the, is the co-latitude. The components of gravity, the r, r is that component of gravity. So you can uh, uh, easily see that um, the, the uh, trajectories of particles are parabolas. So they start from inner sphere or outer sphere, and they go along parabolas, like this. And we can uh, uh, obtain this coefficient from initial conditions, depending on where you release the particle, on, 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 those, on the inner sphere or outer sphere. Um, so now we, we know how particles move, move within the atmosphere. So when particle moves, they carry their, uh, their buoyancy with, with them, and um, they also impart this force on the bulk fluid by emitting inertial waves. So we, and now we can, we can see how they, uh, what, what effects uh, of, of the, those particles, uh, mo particle motion uh, is there. So we can um, easily write the uh, flux of the entropy here. So we, we use entropy here for the atmosphere because e entropy of the rising adiabatically rising particle is conserved. Or we can, uh, in the boostedness fluid, it can be just delta rho. It doesn't matter. So um, and uh, we, we can uh, write uh, it like this and uh, express in the form of buoyancy. 
so this G, G A I G A expresses how, how particles focus uh, into, so if we release particles uniformly from the inner sphere, for example, they, they rise like this, so f they focus towards the pole of the planet. So, and this, uh, this is the focusing factor. So they, they carry, for example, these are warmer particles, so they carry warmer temperatures toward, towards the pole. Um, so all these uh, values can be, can be uh, calculated. Uh, well, these are transcendental equations, so we, we can't really give the analytical formulas, but they're very easily calculated using some simple MATLAB or Mathematica software. So we can uh, pl plug, plug it in and, uh, uh, and calculate the exact trajectories of the particles and, and uh, uh, kind of bulk average uh, temperature of the, of the fluid. Um, so the only thing, we, the parameters that we need to know is uh, the buoyancy uh, uh, with which the particles start. Uh, so how do we uh, guess that? We can look at the, for example, thermal images. This is a thermal image of Saturn, the polar image. So we can, we, uh, can again use this idea about the RMS uh, temperature variation here. Uh, so the typical variation of temperature is about one degree divided by T is about 100 degrees Kelvin at the top of the atmosphere. So you can get some rough idea about the buoyancy of those, of those parcels. Uh, they're kind of dis distributed buoyancy. So this is the factor F here, again, which is the concentration of those parcels. We can't really say anything about uh, what, what's happening in the deep interior, though. Uh, so we just guess that perhaps it's, uh, it's uh, proportional to this. So we introduce these coefficients, a, a1 and a, 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 i and a0, just, just to... Uh, Three minutes, okay. And, um, okay, so th these are the same formulas. So again, we have thermal wind and uh, this circulation due to forcing. And this is what we get. Uh, this is for, the Ju for Jupiter. Um, we get the, uh, this is the total turtle circulation of the, of the atmosphere. And this is the top of the atmosphere uh, where we can compare uh, our profile predicted by theory with the measured profile. So the red line is, is our theory and measured profile is, is uh, the black line. So it's, it's quite good. Uh, uh, well, we, we use a little bit of adjustment because we don't really know uh, about the inner sphere, but, but still it, it works quite well. And the same for Saturn. Um, so it, it gives nicely the equatorial jet. And we also can do similar thing uh, uh, with the Earth's outer core. Earth's outer core is, is very important for dynamo problems, of course, for the generation of magnetic field of the Earth. And uh, it, it works in the same manner, although some the boundary conditions are a bit different, so I'll skip that. Uh, and uh, so this is the profile it predicts. It has two, two anticyclonic jets. Uh, at the tangent cylinder here. And it looks like uh, this kind of behavior is actually observed in the, in, in the data on the variation of the magnetic field of the Earth, this kind of strong jet going in the uh, 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 anticyclotic direction uh, in the Earth's outer core. So I'll just put these conclusions here. Thank you. <laughs>